I want to start by giving credit where credit is due, and that's with Adam Edelstein, who is our manager of diabetes communications, who is constantly scanning the horizon. And through that, he came across uh, Dr. Uh, Kai Zhou's uh, work at University of Massachusetts, Boston, and uh, reached out to me. And I thought it sounded very interesting. And so we're very pleased to invite Dr. Zhou. And uh, let me just say a few words of introduction. Dr. Zhou was raised and, um, and educated in Beijing. He got his, both his bachelor's degree and his master's degree studying uh, sports medicine. And then he came to the United States in 2009 where he received his PhD at the University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois. And from there, he did a postdoctoral training at Eastern Carolina University uh, before joining UMass Boston in 2016. Uh, the subject of his talk today is targeting mitochondrial dynamics to reverse skeletal muscle insulin resistance and obesity. It's always great to make connections with colleagues in the area and in particular a UMass colleague. So Dr. Zhou, let's see where this leads, but thank you for agreeing to speak to us all today. All right, thank you, Dr. Holland for the nice introduction. What am I gonna do in this talk? I'm gonna briefly introduce some background about insulin resistance, uh, skeletal muscle that we are focusing on and we'll share some findings from the human studies and as well as some uh, animal studies that we recently transitioned to. So, so first off, um, I want to share this um, sort of illustration of energy balance with everyone, and and that we know, or many of us know, that our body weight uh, usually will be stable if the energy in is. Um, equivalent to uh, our energy out, right? Usually through the physical activities or exercise. But in some cases, when energy in outweighs the energy output right, into your body, uh, for example, the things we, we sometimes do, especially during holiday breaks, that overnutrition, as you can see on my pointer, as well as some sanitary behavior and physical inactivity then we'll start seeing the gaining weight. And over long term, that's how it becomes obese. And so this is the most recent chart that I copied from the CDC website that showing the prevalence of obesity um, in the US. And as you can see on the top line, which is the trends of the prevalence of obesity that defined as BMI over 30, your body mass index, has been dramatically rising over the past 20 years. And now, uh, according to this data, there are over 40% of the US adults are um, in this category as obese. And more so, similarly, if you look at the blue, uh, the green line at the bottom, that which represents a severe obesity that is defined as a BMI over 40, also steadily uh, increasing. And, about 10% of the US adults are severely obese. So this is a certainly alarming uh, rising rate over the past 20 years. And what's more alarming is, as we know that obesity would dramatically increases the risk of developing many other chronic diseases, uh, such as insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, uh, some heart diseases, cancer, and fatty liver diseases. Right, so these are certainly adding more burden to our um, economics as well as on the patient side. So one of the uh, common condition associated with obesity, right, which is often considered a hallmark characteristic of obesity and a precursor of developing type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. Now, for those of you who don't know what insulin resistance is, it is um, defined as a reduced response, basically of your peripheral tissues to insulin. So these peripheral, peripheral tissues, including skeletal muscle, fat, and the liver. So oftentimes 
these tissues, fat, liver, be very responsive to take the blood glucose out of the bloodstream to lower your blood sugar level. But under insulin resistant conditions, um, they become less responsive. So what that leads to is your pancreas will have to work harder to pump more insulin into the bloodstream to lower your blood glucose level. And that's what this insulin resistance, resistance means. And over time, eventually your pancreas will fail to deliver insulin and that becomes type two diabetes. So as I mentioned, this, these peripheral tissue insulin resistance are very important. Um, in the development of whole body insulin resistance and the diabetes. And one of the tissues that my lab focuses on is skeletal muscle uh, for a couple of reasons. And number one, and we know that skeletal muscle insulin res resistance is a critical component of whole body insulin resistance. And number two, more so, more importantly, is during insulin stimulated conditions. For example, after a meal, uh, skeletal muscle is actually responsible for the majority of the glucose disposal. So for that reason, uh, we focus on what, in, what skeletal muscle play role. What does skeletal muscle play as a role in the development of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes? And within skeletal muscle, and you know, many of you have already seen this sort of photos or similar pictures from your high school biology class or college a and P classes, the, one of the most important critical organelles, which is mitochondria, um, which this small organelle they're often considered as a powerhouse because it produces over 90% of your energy production um, to support your daily physical activity. And in the context of obesity, weight gain, weight change, and insulin resistance. Now, mitochondria is also the primary site for oxidizing all the nutrients that you take from foods, such as carbohydrate, fat, right? And lastly, you know, over the past probably 20, 30 years, and research have been uh, reported that mitochondrial dysfunction has been linked to the development of insulin resistance. Now, whether the dysfunction is a cause or a consequence of insulin resistance is still up to debate. So I'm not trying to get into this debate, but clearly there's a very close tie between mitochondria and insulin resistance. So one of probably the first studies that look into the multiple aspects of mitochondria in the relation to obesity and insulin resistance is probably from this paper published in 2002 by um, David Kelly's group from University of Pittsburgh. And that's really by reading this paper, that's how I got into this field of research. So what they found is in the humans with obesity and insulin resistance, they first look at their mitochondrial content. Now, when I talk about the mitochondrial dysfunction, when something is dysfunctional, <clears throat> oftentimes it's either due to the lack of quantity or due to the impaired quality. So they look at both the quantity and the quality of mitochondria. So they first found there's no difference. Actually, the mitochondria content is normal in skeletal muscle biopsy samples from humans with obesity and insulin resistance. Now, interestingly, when they look at the quality um, or the morphology of the mitochondria, as shown in the middle panels right here on the slide, they saw there's dramatic difference in terms of mitochondrial morphology and quality in skeletal muscle between the lean healthy and, um, humans and obese insulin resistant humans. So what they found is, again, on the lean, the, the mitochondria are very nice shape, uh, pretty big, whereas through the electron microscopy, they found the, the, the tissue section from the obese skeletal muscle. So as I'm pointing out here, there's pretty much a smear instead of each distinct mitochondria. And their sizes tended to look small or smaller. And they also look at sort of a transverse uh, section on the, uh, on the right side of this panel. And they found, again, a nice shape of the mitochondria in the lean, healthy skeletal muscle, whereas the muscle from 
obese, individ obese insulin resistant individual, they saw these vacuoles. And this, again, seems to be the mitochondrial quality or the morphology is completely damaged. And what's more interesting to me is when you look at this overall mitochondrial area, the correlation to the glucose disposal rate, which is a marker of insulin uh, sensitivity, they saw a nice correlation, which means the larger the overall mitochondrial area, the better glucose, glucose disposal rate. So that really got me started looking to the sort of area of mitochondrial quality and insulin resistance. So of course, with the development of the live cell imaging techniques over the last 20 to 25 years, now we know that our mitochondria in reality is quite different from what you normally see from the textbooks. And in fact, our mitochondria actually form a very nice interconnected networks instead of each individual mitochondria. So in one of this um, immunohistochemistry staining picture, you can nicely see these interconnected mitochondrial networks. And these networks are actually quite dynamic. These mitochondria actually normally undergo the continuous cycles of two processes, we call the fission and the fusion, which means these mitochondria are constantly fused to each other to form networks, but also separated from each other um, in order to for the, the mitochondria system to uh, flush out some unhealthy mitochondria. So this is another process called mitophagy, which I'm not going to talk more about mitophagy, rather we focus on mitochondrial dynamics. All right, so mitochondrial dynamics is defined as the continuous cycles of mitochondrial fission and fusion uh, to maintain the mitochondrial quality and healthy function. So more looking to these two processes and pointing out on the right side of my slide, what you can see here is for the fusion process, again, means the segregation of mitochondrial network, there's one important protein that regulates this process, which is called a dynamic related protein one, DRP1, and its active form is the phosphorylated DRP1 at a serine 161 site. Now on the other side, these separate individual mitochondria will also fuse with each other to form this robust network. And this process is called fusion and it's controlled by three main proteins, mitofusion one and the two and optic atrophy one. So these are important proteins I will repeat several times uh, through my talk. So when I first started my lab at UMass Boston, my first question is to address a very simple research question is whether mitochondrial dynamics is dysregulated in skeletal muscle that from humans with obesity and insulin resistance. So to answer this question, we use a model called the human skeletal muscle cells. All right, so these cells are human primary cells that we can easily isolate from human muscle biopsy samples. So as you can see on this small picture that usually we put a needle uh, syring a needle into the human quad muscle and take a small piece of muscle biopsy sample out. And we can culture these cells in petri dish and they can form these nice spindle-shaped myotubes, which is basically equivalent to the muscle fibers in our human skeletal muscle. And a nice thing about this model is that can allow us to look at some cellular dysfunctions at a, cell, at a muscle cell level. And more importantly, to allow us to study, we call this intrinsic metabolic phenotype of skeletal muscle, because in these cells, there is no vessel inference, there's no neural factors, there are no hormones, which are normally sort of confounding factors in our human body. So we decided to use this model. And a nice, another beauty th beautiful thing of this model is that these cells actually retained a lot of these metabolic characteristics from the donors. So I'm just going to show you one example that throughout our characterization is we look at one of the things that insulin stimulated glucose oxidation by using C14 labeled carbon. Um, carbon. So we can look at the 
how well are these cells oxidize glucose. And you can see in this yellow bar represents the lean cells. They respond pretty well in response to insulin, whereas the muscle cells from obese, they essentially, these responses are blunted. So clearly showing these cells retain this insulin resistant phenotype. And just to add another thing to sort of to advocate for this model is when we compare our findings to the previous findings from the whole body level, we saw the exactly same pattern and the magnitude. Again, showing the, these human skeletal muscle cells that re does retain a lot of the characteristics from the whole body level. So with that model in hand, we start recruited a group of lean individuals and obese individuals, and we collect the muscle biopsy samples from their the vessel lateralis muscle, and we culture these muscle cells and form the myotubes. And then we look at uh, their mitochondrial network structure, dynamic profile. So here's a very um, simple characteristic table. And you can see the on the right side, these human subjects are really obese. If you look at the body weight and the BMI, and they are also very insulin resistant based on their insulin fasting insulin level and the HOMA IR, which is a marker of um, peripheral insulin resistance. So the higher the number means more insulin resistant. So this work has been done by my first master's student, Anders Gunderson. And when he came into my lab during my first year at UMass Boston, he uh, sort of took over this project and first quantified uh, the mitochondrial network structure. So in this study, he use a confocal microscopy, look at the uh, morphology of mitochondrial network um, in these cells. And what you can see here in the links, these mitochondria are very nicely forming the networks. Whereas if you look at on the obese cells, you see many, many uh, separated individual dots, right? These red dots are individual mitochondria. And then he also did some quantification that found there are a lot more individual mitochondria in this, these myotubes from obese individuals. And these muscle cells that derived from individuals with obesity and insulin resistance also have much smaller mitochondria network size, even though they have more mitochondria networks, but the size is much smaller. So indicating that mitochondria are fragmented in these myotubes derived from obese and insulin resistant individuals. And then he went on and quantified some uh, regulatory proteins as I introduced just a few minutes ago that he saw a significant increase of the active form of DRP1 through Western blotting. And he didn't see any change on the mitochondrial fusion side. So clearly, if we put it into the context of mitochondrial dynamics, clearly the mitochondrial dynamics has been, the balance is being uh, sort of impaired with excess of fusion, but without much changing fusion. So this is all good at that point. And we decided, well, if this mitochondrial dynamics is really related or associated with insulin resistance, then if we look at some interventions that are known to improve insulin sensitivity with we'll the rebalance this mitochondrial dynamics, right? In the skeletal muscle from humans with obesity and insulin resistance. So to address this question, um, we look at two approaches that we know they can improve insulin sensitivity, can even reduce body weight. And the one is through the lifestyle modification, exercise training, and the other is a surgical intervention that we were able to get some samples in collaboration with physicians, which is gastro bypass surgery. So the first approach to sort of um, represent this intervention that we know to improve insulin sensitivity is a in vitro model of exercise. We use this called electrical pulse stimulation to mimic exercise in this cell culture model. So in this study, we use an electrical power stimulator, and then we can put this, these electrodes into this petri dishes that there are cells that cultured at the bottom of each well, and the electrical current can pass through these myotubes or muscle cells and to stimulate some 
contractions in this mild tube to mimic that muscle contraction during exercise in humans. Now, one thing I'd like to point out for this model is that all the mild tubes, whether they're from the limbs or from the obese, they receive the same workload. So one of the challenges we, when we do exercise studies in humans is that it's hard to prescribe exercise at the same low workload to all individuals because obese individuals usually have lower physical fitness level. So if we prescribe their 70% of the maximal, oftentimes they don't receive the same absolute workload. And in this case, that we're able to eliminate that, eliminate that limitation and all the individuals, all the cells receive the same workload, same stimulation. And they never late to the studies for those who conduct the human studies and uh, that's really um, a challenge in human studies, right? So, okay, so for this model, again, we first have to validate this model to see whether they actually induce muscle contraction in these muscle fibers. So hopefully I can make this work to show you a video. So if we pay close attention to the myotubes that pointed with some red arrow, you can clearly see they are contracting. One second off, one second active, contracting one tubes right here. So that gives really gives us some confidence that we know these myotubes are actually contracting just as they do uh, when humans uh, exercise. So again, we, we had a visiting scholar uh, join my lab in probably 2017 or 18 that he took this model and electrical stimulated a lot of cells. And he looked at these regular pro regulatory proteins first and as I point out here, the DRP1, just as we hypothesized that with the electrical power stimulation, there is a reduction in the phosphor DRP1, uh, which is an active form of DRP1. So showing, indicating that mitochondrial fusion is reduced. Whereas on the other side, again, on the fusion side, nothing really happened with this muscle contraction model. Now, one thing I do want to point out a little bit is we don't see the same response in the biotubes from the lean individuals, suggesting there might be some divergent uh, response in mitochondrial dynamics in response to exercise. Dr. Zoe, may I ask a quick question? Yes. What is the uh, temporal nature of these, te these trends that you're showing us? How long is the stimulation occurring in vitro? And then how long can you sustain the muscle fibers in vitro? Yes, yeah, good question. So. These are the parameters we use. Um, so this is more mimic the exercise training model. We do the 24 hour continuous hours of stimulation uh, with a relatively low voltage, I would say. So it's more mimicking endurance type, um, moderate intensity physical activity. And we do the one hertz, which means it's one second on that muscle contracting the one second off. And after 24 hours, um, then we do all these stainings and collect these uh, samples for these characterizations. And, and the other thing I've wondered about is this contraction that you're stimulating is without load. Is there any way to put load on the muscle fibers? Because the, you know, obviously muscles are pulling on something when they contract, typically. Yeah, when we're doing this contraction as sort of mimicking that pulling, I think you, what you meant is more like resistance exercise that you're putting load on your muscle. Yes. It's more like a weightlifting things. And this is more, I think, mimicking the running type, more endurance type. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we have tried multiple protocols that we, um, not so much on the load side, because it really can't mimic every condition, but like I said, it, but th this model does give us some tools that we can look at the molecular adaptations to exercise at the cellular level. Um, so we look at different voltages, uh, different duration, things like that. Uh, so this one I'm particularly presenting today is more endurance type, like 
running activity, for example. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. So again, this, if you remember the, the, the fission activity was actually high uh, in the obese cells and now through this electropower stimulation, we're able to reduce it. So clearly suggesting that mitochondrial dynamics might have been rebalanced following these contractions in mitotubes in the humans with obesity and insulin resistance. So then one would ask, well, if the mitochondrial dynamics are rebalanced, what about their network and morphology? So again, we used the confocal microscopy and immunostaining that we were able to see the change of mitochondrial network size is, put my pointer back on. So the size that you can see on the bottom right side, the size of mitochondrial network is increased and the number of individual mitochondrial, which is again, an indicator of mitochondrial fission is reduced. And if you want, can, not sure if these uh, images are large enough, but you can see there are definitely more uh, puncta, puncta or individual mitochondria on the left side, which is not stimulated. Whereas with the incident, uh, with the electrical power stimulation, you will see more uh, stripes or lines, which indicating the mitochondria are more fused to each other to form networks. And the last piece of data from this study I wanna present here is a nice correlation between the delta change of the DRP1 phosphorylation versus the delta change of the phosphor AKT, which is the molecule in, uh, representing the insulin signaling activity. So you see a nice negative correlation, which suggesting that the more reduction of DRP1 phosphorylation through this muscle contraction, there are more uh, improvement on the insulin signaling side. So again, showing this nice association between DRP1 and insulin sensitivity. So this is one intervention we used, and I, I mentioned earlier that we were also able to collect some muscle cells from the patients who uh, undergone Rouen-Noir gastro bypass surgery. So this is the um, sort of the work I started when I was a postdoc at East Carolina University, where they have uh, they have a very large um, center to do this type of surgery. So what this does is basically reroute your GI tract to, to bypass this, the, the, the larger part of your stomach. And this is a, probably one of the most common and effective surgery to treat obesity. And it causes a very significant weight loss right after the surgery. And what's more interesting and you know, fascinating to me is they dramatically improve your metabolic profile of those patients. They improve, it improves insulin sensitivity. It reverses actually type two diabetes after surgery with a very successful uh, rate. So this sort of the luxury we had that we were able to uh, recruit those patients and ask them to uh, commit three muscle biopsies for us to do this type of research. So we had these obese insulin resistant individuals uh, that giving us muscle biopsy samples before surgery, as well as one month and seven month post the surgery. So keep in mind, these three muscle biopsies are from the same individuals before and after surgery. We also have a group of the lean controls and we went through the same protocol. So the sub subject characteristics, again, as you can see it, like a highlighted in red, you can see before surgery, these individuals and patients are again, very obese. Uh, they're severely obese and they're very insulin resistant. But if you look at their fasting glucose level, uh, they're not diabetic. They are not diabetic. They're not type two diabetic. They're only insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. Now, if you look at at a seven month after surgery time point, which on the most right side of the slide, you can see, even though their body weight were still in the category of obesity, their metabolic profile has been largely improved. They have an improved insulin, fasting insulin level in blood and their HOMA IR level, again, it's a mark of insulin resistance, is almost reversed and virtually no difference when you compare to the lean controls. 
So again, clearly showing the surgery effectively improved their metabolic health, uh, effectively improved the insulin sensitivity. But to our research question, what happened to their mitochondrial profile? So again, we first look at the fission marker, uh, DRP1. So to point out one more time, these muscle cells derived from these obese insulin resistant individuals had much higher level of DRP1, but you can clearly see this um, time dependent reduction of DRP1 throughout the course of post surgery. And at seven months post surgery, um, you can see a significant reduction of DRP1 in comparison to the pre state. And another thing I want to point out is from a physiological relevance standpoint, is that the level of this DRP1 is essentially being reversed and back to the lean, healthy individuals. Now, the other side of the story, on the mitochondrial fusion side, we look at the MFN1, MFN2, and OPA1, all three markers, and we don't see really see much change. Again, showing these interventions that improved insulin sensitivity, we're able to um, improve the mitochondrial dynamics to rebalance the mitochondrial dynamics. And the last slide on from this study, we also look at the uh, insulin stimulated glucose oxidation rate. Again, we use that as a marker of insulin sensitivity in skeletal muscle. And what you can see here is a nice uh, significant difference between the links and the obese before surgery and after surgery, there was a significant improvement of this insulin stimulated glucose oxidation rate in these cells. And we'll again, look at the correlation between this phospho-DRP1 and the insulin sensitivity marker. We again see a very nice correlation suggesting the more reduction in DRP1 active form, the better improvement on the skeletal muscle insulin action. So just to quickly summarize the first part of my talk, and we know, I hope I can convince you that DRP1 is hyperactivated in muscle from humans with obesity insulin resistance. And this hyperactivation is really, really uh, strongly correlated to impaired insulin signaling and the glucose metabolism in stellar muscle. And we used a couple interventions that are known to improve insulin sensitivity. And both of them shown effective normalization of DRP1 activity and the rebalance of mitochondrial dynamics in this, these skeletal muscle cells. So with all these sort of encouraging findings, one thing we notice is, and as many researchers know that causations or the correlations does, doesn't mean causation. And the question remains is whether or not DRP1 mediated mitochondrial fission directly contributes to insulin resistance in obese induced um, in skeletal muscle insulin resistance. So now I'm gonna switch the gear a little bit uh, into the preclinical pre animal models, you know, to understand this more mechanistic question, whether this DRP1 mediated mitochondrial fission play a role in regulating skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity and whether it can improve metabolic health, right? So this is the work actually uh, done by my first PhD student um, and it's part of his dissertation. So in this study, he created a mouse model of DRP1 muscle specific and now called a mouse model. And for those of you, uh, who do these MOS models, uh, we use a Cree and LOX system. So many of you probably use that model, uh, the system in your own laboratories. So we first have purchased a mouse line from the Jackson lab called Cree ER. So this is a conditional Cree that it carries a Cree recombinance uh, specific on the electro, uh, estrogen receptor and is specifically driven by a human skeletal muscle actin. So indicate it only works on skeletal muscle tissues. And it's a conditional Cree, which means um, it 
needs to be activated by the tamoxifen injection. And we also acquired a mouse line of DRP1 flux mice from our collaborators at Johns Hopkins University. So this is the mouse line um, where there are two lock sites in the DRP1 gene sequence um, between the axon three and the six. So in normal conditions, these mice are very normal. Their DRP1 expression is normal. Uh, this flux sequence is not skipped or stopped until that they meet the Cree gene, the Cree recombinance that can turn on these lux sites. And then at that point, this uh, segment will be skipped and then DRP1 can be knocked out. So by crossbreed these two mouse lines, and we were able to create this DRP1 muscle specific knockout. Um, we chose to use uh, hydrozygous in this study because there are several studies um, have reported that homozygous, which is a very um, effective knockout to 90% of DRP1 causes severe muscle atrophy. So we decided to use the hydrozygous to keep some levels of DRP1 in scalp muscle. And all these mice are from C57 black six background and they are completely normal during development stage. And then we do the tamoxifen injection at week 10 of their, um, at, at age of these mice to induce this DRP1 knockout in muscle specific pattern. So with that model in hand, uh, we did the diet intervention to give the mice either low fat diet or high fat diet with either 10% calorie from fat or 45% calorie from fat. So these are very common diets to induce insulin, insulin resistance in these animals. And with four weeks to establish this insulin resistance phenotype before we do the tamoxifen injection to induce DRP1 knockout. And one thing I wanna point out here is on this left side, we have these control mice that they also received these tamoxifen injections just to offset any potential uh, side effects from tamoxifen injection only. So that we know at the end, anything we see different is from the DRP1 knockout. So we continue giving them the same diet for four weeks uh, whether low fat diet or high fat diet. So that results in four groups in this study. And at the end, we measured uh, food consumption, weights, um, metabolic profile, and mitochondrial profile. So just as we did the previous slide, we again first have to validate this model. And we look at, uh, we measure the DRP1 protein expression just to validate whether uh, the DRP1 is being reduced or partially knockout in muscle tissue. So we look at two muscle tissues. Uh, one is gastrocnemius, the other is TBS anterior. So by average, we saw about 26% reduction of DRP1 in these muscle tissue. So that gave us a pretty good confidence because this is within the range of previously reported results from studies using this DRP1 knockout model, whereas between 25 to 30%. And what's more encouraging to us is, as I put this dash line here, the reduction in these wild type mice fed with high fat diet. Now with the DRP1 reduction, we were able to pretty much reverse or reduce to this lean, um, sort of normal healthy wild type level uh, in both muscle tissues. And more is that we also look at other tissues just to see if there's an, uh, any unspecific uh, DRP1 reduction in this model. And we don't see any change of the pro DRP1 protein expression, whether in liver or heart. Uh, we also look at the fat tissue as well, but none of those tissues we saw any reduction of DRP1. So then we went on um, to look at the, some basic pheno phenotypes. We look at the body weight, again, the high fat diet, uh, significantly increase the body weight, uh, regardless of phenotype, uh, the, the, the genotype. So whether the wild type or DRP1 knockout mice, there's no difference, uh, suggesting this DRP1 knockout doesn't 
induce any weight loss or slow down the weight gain. Uh, similarly, on the fat tissue mass, uh, we saw an increase in the mice received high fat diet. Uh, but again, there is no genotype or genetic effects. We also look at their food consumption. Uh, there is no difference there either. So next, we look at a metabolic profile. We first look at some blood markers. And again, with the high fat diet, as we expected, induces this insulin resistance phenotype. Uh, by looking at the fasting insulin level, there's a significant increase compared to the wild type low fat diet, fed mice, the HOMA IR is largely increased. But what's interesting here is in these muscle specific DRPO NACA mice, these impairments seems to be alleviated. So even though they are still high compared to the wild type animals, but the, the magnitude is significantly reduced. And then we also did some uh, metabolic challenge tests. One of the glucose tolerance tests where we give these mice a bolus of glucose and we look at their response. Uh, and for those of you who have done this type of study, uh, it's similar to the oral glucose tolerance test in humans. And when you receive a bolus of glucose or sugary beverage, you expect to see a spike of the glucose concentration of blood. And over the time, what reduce and back to normal. And you can see here in the mice fed with high fat diet, which is this blue line and the green line here. Um, the wild type is a blue line here. You see a higher spike uh, indicating the glucose intolerance. Now, if we look at this green line, which represent the muscle specific DRPO knockout mice, even though they fed with high fat diet, their response is blunted. And when we quantify uh, these curves as area under the curve. So the higher the area, the higher the bar means more insulin, uh, more glucose intolerant. Uh, so we were able to see about 27% reduction of uh, the, this area under the curve in muscle specific DRPO knockout mice under a high fat diet fat feeding. We also did an insulin tolerance test. Again, it's a test to test the whole body insulin resistance. So in this case, the more reduction is actually better, indicates better insulin response. So nonetheless, uh, we were able to see about 40% improvement of this insulin tolerance response, indicating there's improvement at the whole body level in terms of insulin sensitivity. So now back to the muscle side, as our focus in scalp muscle, say we went on to look at the muscle insulin signaling. And we are currently looking at other markers of skull muscle insulin sensitivity, such as glucose uptake. But by just looking at the AKT phosphorylation, again, a marker of insulin sensitivity or the signaling, we saw a nice reduction in this blue bar, which again represents the wild type mice fed with high fat diet. Uh, showing this insulin resistance phenotype. But this phenotype or the impairment was uh, reversed or disappeared in the skeletal muscle DRP1 specific uh, knockout mice, suggesting that partial DRP1 knockout improved the insulin signaling in these diet induced insulin resistance mice. Now, one thing that comes to really interesting to us, which I don't, probably don't have time to explain, is if we look at the low fat diet, fat mice, the DRPO knockout actually causes some detrimental effects. So again, we are, there seems to be some divergence in terms of what DRPO does to the normal healthy condition as, or, and to the insulin resistant condition. But now as to focus on this insulin resistance side, now we're trying to dive into the mechanism, right? What causes this improvement or the alleviation of insulin resistance? So again, we look at many, many markers of all these mitochondrial uh, quality control processes, fission, fusion, biogenesis, mitophagy. But other than what I already shown you, the reduction of DRP1, we don't really see any significant change in this knockout model, whether the fusion markers or biogenesis markers or mitophagy markers. And so, to summarize these markers, we know as for now is that fission markers 
dramatically reduced uh, to the normal level and no change in fusion. So suggesting again, that partial DRP1 knockout rebalances mitochondrial dynamics. And I also went on to do some qualitative uh, analysis of mitochondrial network structure. So here is a muscle longitudinal section of the tissues using uh, immunostaining by staining the mitochondria with a TOM20 an antibody uh, recognize all the mitochondria. So two specific images I wanna point out. The number one is at the bottom left side is the mice fed with high fat diet. So you can see the network is somewhat damaged. You will see more individual, these green dots rather than those stripes as we can see in these wild type low fat uh, diet fed mice. However, if we look at these knockout mice on their high fat diet fat feeding state condition, this damage seems to be restored. The network structure looks much better. So suggesting again, this partial skeletal muscle DRP1 knockout, we were able to restore some mitochondrial network architecture in these insulin resistance mice. So then we question, what about the, the function? What about the function of the mitochondria? So one way to look at the mitochondrial function is the oxygen consumption. You know, how much oxygen being consumed during oxidative phosphorylation. So we isolated the mitochondria from these animals, the muscle tissue, and we use different um, substrates to assess uh, mitochondrial respiration at different states supported by different complexes in the electron transport chain. So it's really surprised to us is that we didn't see any change of mitochondrial respiration or content uh, in these mice. So suggesting that muscle-specific DRP or knockout or the reduction has no effect on mitochondrial respiration. So that was really give us a little pause and to think of what could be uh, sort of the link between the DRP1 and insulin resistance in skeletal muscle. And the one thing we uh, started looking into just recently is the mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. As we know that during the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, uh, there's also an electron leak from the, our mitochondria. And the, the, these leak of the electrons or hydrogen ions can form a species called uh, reactive oxygen species. And the, one of the most important one is this H2O2, uh, hydrogen peroxide. And we know that hydrogen peroxide uh, can activate a group of kinases that can block insulin signaling to reduce insulin signaling and insulin sensitivity. So we start looking into um, this mitochondrial ROS production area, and we know there are actually a bunch of sites can produce uh, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide in mitochondria during oxidative phosphorylation. And there are several main sites uh, which are represented, which are presented here is one, pyruvate dehydrogenase. And there are several complexes uh, within the, the ETC electron transporter chain, complex one, two, three are also major sites for these uh, production. So among all these sites, we found three specific sites that using different combinations of substrates, we found the PDH supported complex one and complex two, uh, the hydrogen peroxide pr production was significantly reduced or blunted in these muscle specific DRP1 knockout mice under high fat diet feeding condition compared to the wild type mice. So, we are collecting more data at this moment. Uh, this project just recently been funded by the NIH R15 mechanism. So we further looking into whether any of these sites are actually um, being impaired that can explain these um, dysfunction with high fat diet and how these dysfunctional units being improved uh, with DRP1 knockout. So, one thing we also want to look at is uh, because in literature there have been shown that DRP1 knockout causes muscle atrophy. So we want to look at whether this uh, DRP1 partial knockout causes any muscle damage uh, 
Um, and by looking at the muscle mass, right, the muscle morphology, and we also quantified some animals with their cross-sectional area or the fiber type um, distribution, we don't see any change. So at this point, we feel there is no negative impact on the muscle quality or muscle atrophy in these partial GRPO knockout mice. So the, for the last part of the talk, um, and uh, due to the time, um, I'll probably briefly go through the last few slides just to share a little bit of the, the work that from the uh, translational perspective that can DRP1 mediated mitochondrial fission be used as a potential therapeutic target to treat insulin resistance? As we know, we can't really knock out any genes in humans, but what if there are any pharmacological uh, inhibitors that we can use to inhibit the DRP1? So there is actually a commercially available DRP1 specific inhibitor called mitochondrial division inhibitor one, MDRVI1, that can specifically target the DRP1 and can suppress its activity by inhibiting its translocation to, DRP, uh, to, to mitochondria. And this drug has been proved that is specifically targeting DRP1 and has been used in many, many studies using different disease models, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and kidney disease. But none of those studies have a look at, uh, at a skeletal muscle level or the muscle insulin resistance. So a quick overview of the study design. Again, we use the animal model, the C57 black six wildcat mice, and we're giving them the diet intervention to induce obesity and insulin resistance. And after that, we're giving the uh, insulin resistant mice either a week of this inhibitor or a saline as a control. And we also have the low fat diet mice served as a control. And they also received a week of saline injection. So because of how this uh, pharmacological inhibitor works, we look at this DRP1 translocation by looking at how much DRP1 is expressed in the mitochondrial fraction, you mean how much being translocated. And as we see with a high fat diet, there's a significant increase of the DRP1 translocation to uh, mitochondrial fraction, indicating there is an increase of mitochondrial fission. But with this inhibitor, we saw a nice reduction suggesting this drug is, works as it's supposed to. And we also look at some co-localization of the mitochondria and the DRP1. So if you look at the far right side, these orange co-localization indicates my DRP1 translocated to the mitochondria. And we see a nice reduction just by visually with this co-localization. Again, indicating that DRP1 in, in, that's the MD, MDIVI1 inhibits DRP1 translocation. So what are the outcomes on the metabolic health? Again, we look at GTT and ITT tests and look at skull muscle insulin signaling and all falls into our hypothesis that with high fat diet clearly induce this insulin resistance phenotype, but with this inhibitor that we were able to see a alleviation or blunted response in these mice fed with high fat diet. And there's also improvement of insulin signaling in skeletal muscle. So, and they are, we are conducting more studies that to further validate the study and also to study long-term to see what about the long-term effects of inhibiting DRP1. Does that, are these findings still hold true? Uh, does the, these inhibitors um, causes any detrimental effects? So just to, Finally, quickly summarize these, uh, our findings that first we know this inhibiting muscle DRP1 mediated mitochondrial fission does improve insulin sensitivity based on our knockout model, as well as this whole body glucose homeostasis, but only under insulin resistant condition, uh, not at a normal healthy condition, which is a very nice, interesting question to follow. And these improvements appear to be partly due to reduced mitochondrial drive uh, hydrogen peroxide production. And we think this DRP1 mediated mitochondrial fusion can be a future potential therapeutic target to treat insulin resistance. But of course, uh, more studies are needed to investigate long term effects of DRP1 inhibition and to see what are the specific extent of DRP1 inhibition that to make it effective for the therapeutics in the future. 
so with that, I'd like to thank, uh, most importantly, my current and former members of the lab. They carried out all these studies, did all the heavy lifts, um, especially Benjamin Kugler, uh, conducted several studies uh, in my lab. I also thank the collaborators uh, on campus and outside the campus, especially Hiromi Sasaki, that share that DRP1 flux mice with us from Johns Hopkins University. And last but not least, the funding agencies that to allow us to continue doing this research in our lab. So with that, I'll finish and happy to take any questions. 